There were really two major ideas that emerged um, as a part of this deinstitutionalization movement. One was mainstreaming, that is to, to give people opportunities to live in a more normal environment and to mainstream them into uh, either there's normal schools if they were students, but into the community if they were adults. The other key concept was uh, the, the concept of normalization. And, and this is really where Wolf uh, became a major player because what he told us, uh, and, and certainly he was my mentor and many other people's mentors, was that whatever you do at the community level, do indeed make their environment normal. Don't, don't reconstitute an institutional environment within the community. First time that I encountered it was when the then called President's Committee on Mental Retardation published what we called the Blue Book, which was the Principles of Normalization in Human Services, and it was really a monograph at that time, uh, introduced to Wolf Wolfensberger, uh, heard about this fellow Bent Nierye. Uh he actually came over here, uh, toured around, I happened to be with him at one of the tours uh, on the West Coast in institutions in California, uh, as were some other people. And we began to get a flavor, because that was pretty early in the development of non-institutional services in this country. When I encountered the term normalization, I think it put perhaps a framework around daily routines, uh, activities that were suitable depending on the age of the person that was, was being assisted. Uh, yeah, I think it uh, helped define some of the role, various roles that people would have, uh, whether you know, teacher, student, uh, parent, child, uh, staff, worker, counselor versus a recipient of service. Uh, normalization involved uh, providing service in the most normal fashion possible. If it was a residential program, it should take place in a house that was very similar to the house next to it and throughout the community. If it was a school program, it should not be a segregated classroom or a segregated uh, uh, setting and so on. As much involvement with the, the child or the adult uh, with, with daily routines and so on so, that, that most of us would, would be expecting to participate in. Certainly one has to uh, um, admit it is in part uh, from Bank Nierier, from uh, Niels Eric Bank Mickelson. Uh, Wolf really popularized it in this country, but it was uh, an evolution of something that was already um, among the thinking of people in Scandinavia. Um, but I still think it's one of the most powerful, simple constructs you can explain it to almost anybody. Now, Wolf tended to make it somewhat more complicated when he developed his training sessions and uh, uh, tried to systematize it. But for me, it was always that, that very simple template that you could put on to almost any situation that really helped you think about were we living up to um, a normal life for somebody with a disability. I do like Nerier's version of normalisation or Nerier's expression um, where he talks about, I guess, respecting where people come from and who they are and then using the ideas to open up new opportunities for them. Um, I have concerns about the, um, the Wolfensberger um, normalisation in that, to me, it seems like it's about closing doors that don't, that aren't consistent with what people would see as being age appropriate. Um, I really worry about that, particularly with people with profound intellectual disabilities whose range of interest might be so small. The range of things that they can do might be so small. And if one of those things is blowing raspberries or um, liking tickles or liking it when somebody speaks to them in a really animated way and them, somebody then comes along and says that's not age appropriate and says that's got to stop that's a real worry because those sort of long learned behaviours those long learned things that aren't easily replaced when it takes you so long to learn anything 
and suddenly it's something that's not being valued, then that's a real worry. From a biology point of view and who studied statistics, normal wasn't troubling to me at all. I understood that as meaning sort of the central tendency in the bell curve. And Wolf would even draw the bell curve and he would talk about normalization does mean minimizing people's disabilities where we can. It also means expanding what society is willing to accept as normal, as acceptable behavior or needs. And the third leg of normalization in the early days was, and then representing people as positively as possible, the power of language. So it was rehabilitation, it was social change, and it was the power of language. And those three things are brilliant, they're as, they're as meaningful today as they were then. You know, what is normal, you would say, the range of choices about lifestyle and living situation and relationships that all of us have. So normal can be an incredibly wide range of just letting people have the ability to lead lives as regular citizens with the supports they need. I hadn't really heard about it when it was a Scandinavian idea. I'd heard about it really through Wolfensberger's uh, promotion of the idea around the late 60s, early 70s. And um, again, it was a uh, it was kind of a an appeal to look at the humanity of people with disabilities in this case, but also uh, other groups that were devalued. So I think that was what intrigued me about it was just the uh, fact that it was a a way to force me to think about people's uh, humanity and that uh, that as a society we weren't really doing a very good job with it. Normalization, well, it um, was hard to come and everybody felt um, uncomfortable in using it because it was an, um, an abstruse word that you didn't really know what it meant. And so one problem was the word normal and what the hell is normal, but the other was that the term normalization is used in, to mean utter, completely and utterly different things. It's used in a, in a, in a political sense normalizing relationships between countries, for instance, uh, uh, normalizing certain practices that have been considered atypical and saying, no, we're gonna, this is, we're gonna normalize that. But it has nothing to do with, with the way that he was using it. And so it created a lot of confusion about, about what it meant and people attributed to it meanings that never existed, okay? And of course, he had to deal with the way the word normalization was misused in terms of rather than being treated and like any people, other people who are considered normal, where people end up interpreting normalization as, okay, we do this and do this and this plan, this plan, and then they're going to become normal. You know, uh, there are quotes where Wolf says normalization was a poor choice of words. Okay, it's too close to normal. People misinterpreted it. They think that what it's all about is trying to make people normal. And, and it's not about that at all. It's about you know, it, it's about ensuring that they have uh, life conditions th that are normal if such a thing exists. And, and it speaks to people having access to the good things in life. Use of the term normal uh, as a root of normalization led opponents uh, to find an easy attack on the term by saying, well, you're not going to make people with intellectual disabilities normal, uh, essentially. And of course, that wasn't what uh, Wolfensberger had in mind at all, but um, rather one wanted to promote the normalization of the uh, conditions that would lead to, you know, the most appropriate behaviors that would allow one not, not, not to be able to be so easily stigmatized in society and to open up opportunities so one could demonstrate what one can do. Uh, anyone of the highest intellectual ability can be placed in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment in which uh, the supports are, are, are comprehensively removed one by one and become, you know, literally a babbling person within time. So it's, uh, uh, it's a stigmatizing term, but any term would have been stigmatizing and, and would have been uh, unacceptable to, to a degree. I can tell you within the first half an hour of hearing Dr. Wolfensberger speak about normalization, um, I was totally taken um, and just felt almost in a way that I, like I had um, come home. Wolf took that concept 
and really popularized it, both in North America and internationally. And he very systematically defined it. But the idea of, of age appropriateness and culture appropriateness and the thought that much of what we do in the name of quality for people with disabilities really denies them their age, infantilizes them, and separates them from society. I think normalization is one of those ideas, and I never had a chance to talk to Wolf about this, but it's one of those ideas that's bigger than any one person. I think normalization uh, provided a very clear description of reality. It also provided you with a strategy for addressing that devaluation. Here is a big social problem, a major social problem. Here are people who are very vulnerable, who don't have control of their own lives, and here is a way that we can begin to help them. And that really struck me uh, to my core as something that I should be doing. His definition, I think it was just uh, enormously helpful, practical, with hundreds of implications, uh, you know, for actions. Normalization, to this day, I still refer to it, it's back on my, it's on my bookshelf, uh, was a sea change. It was a sea change in the way we thought about people with intellectual disabilities. It was a change in the way we thought about supporting people. It sort of challenged the fundamental notions we had, you know, the, the, the sort of service model at that point, if you weren't in a state facility, you were in these 12 or 14 person group homes. These big, the people used to find really big houses in, in old neighborhoods in town, and I mean really big, and I went to see a bunch of those. Uh, and I said, okay, well, it was certainly nicer than Rosewood, which was the state institution that the people had come out of, but it was sort of like a college dorm on steroids. You had all these people with disabilities and all these staff, and what normalization forced you to think about was, well, is this really somebody's home? Is this really how people live? Uh, and I find myself still using it and still asking those questions today, so while some of the language may be dated, I think the ideas are still fresh. It was pretty clear to me that once you had read normalization, you never really looked at the world the same way again. What this did was it put language to the things I had, I was feeling, put language around the things, the experiences Rob had had uh, around his, his wounding, around the different roles that people, that people who are disabled experience in the segregation and the congregation, the labeling, um, the abuse that he, he had experienced, and um, just the ongoing struggle to try to make sure that he had, had a decent life. So when normalization came around, it, was, it, it just made so much sense to, um, to you know, it, gets, it puts some form and some planning to like, how do we get out of this mess that we have as a, as a society? I guess it's true that some of the most revolutionary concepts are the simplest. Uh, and the notion um, that people need to be supported in situations that are normal to all of the rest of us uh, created a prism for me um, through which I looked at everything after that. I mean, once you've sort of imbibed that idea uh, that things should be age appropriate, that they should be uh, appropriate to your community, et cetera, it's impossible to look at an institution and say that's normal. Uh, it's impossible to go into a large residential setting of uh, adults with uh, intellectual disabilities and see bunny rabbits on the walls and think that that's appropriate. I think for for many of the people, normalization um, it just it it just be, it just swept through our field. It became it became one of those enlightening moments for everybody who read it. You know, and we began to have. It, it sort of triggered all kinds of exciting new ways of thinking about supporting people and looking at people and hanging out with people and talking to people. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of, of you know, helping people to uh, remove some of that stigma so that people would look differently. And um, it, just, it just reoriented all of our thinking about things. Normalization uh, provided a very clear description of reality. Uh, for a very vulnerable group of people or groups of people. It also provided you with a strategy for addressing that devaluation. A wonderful chapter in the Normalization book where Wolf talks about Sweden with their 
idea of activation so that people, even with the most profound disabilities in their smaller institutions way back in the late 60s and 70s, uh, insisted that the most impaired, even which in North America would have meant bedridden um, virtually all the time, most people were activated. So they were taken out of bed whenever it was you know, possible, which was most of the time, and they were made to be active physically and mentally, uh, which was probably Wolf's inspiration. Maybe that's where he got this idea of the developmental model. I honestly don't know. One big one is just social behaviors. Hello, please, thank you. When you're living in an environment that doesn't have those basic social courtesies built into the rhythms and routines, um, we all learn to say please and thank you at home. If please and thank you isn't in the social routine, you're not gonna pick it up. Um, if um, eating your food fast, because that's the only way you could get it before it was stolen, you develop the behavior of gouging, gorging food quickly in order to protect your supply of food. And so all those, just the way of addressing, um, if, if everybody around you doesn't care how you look, you don't come to care how you look. So you don't pay attention to whether your hair is combed or whether you have breakfast on your face because it doesn't matter to anybody around you so you don't develop the consciousness of that so that when you're in society you are like everyone else. And so often there were discussions and debates about this culturally normative people and were we making people be normal? Were we denying who they were? And um, and that's a complex concept, and there is some legitimacy to deliberating that. That, um, that, but I don't think that's what he meant. And um, I, I think that when being yourself, however that is, is the consequence of having been in a deficient environment where you were denied typical experiences, then that's not being yourself and who you are. That's really being the product of a deficient environment. And so, um, and, and, and what's, what's problematic with that is it creates a barrier, be, barrier between you and everybody else, and so it interrupts relationships. Right after reading Normalization, my husband and I opened a group home with six kids. We were very conscious of what they wore to school, um, not, not all six hanging on the front yard, in the front yard yelling and screaming, but, um, and carrying on like kids might do, but understanding that they had this sort of extra burden where people expected them not to act like everybody else, so if they were acting like the worst of everybody else, it was really multiplied. Very difficult when you have 20 people on a living unit uh, to normalize that living unit. But if you broke it down, you started thinking, well, uh, is there anything I can do? And uh, things like put an emphasis on personal possessions, put an emphasis on choice. Do all the rooms have to be the same? Can people have things that, that are things that are valued and important to them? Um, uh, does it, can the living units be made more personalized and more home-like? So while they didn't seem significant in terms of the big picture, because they were still things, um, the setting was still the institution, it was still a very large congregate setting, um, what you began to see was people leaving the building. Uh, the clothing that people was, were wearing was much more um, age appropriate. Um, the way people were being addressed was much more valued and valuing. It wasn't that normalization was a protest. Normalization was a kind of remedy for the injustice and for the dehumanization. And uh, so I think that was very helpful because uh, we not only could be angry and upset and protest, we could also do something about it. And there was a, almost like a plan of a sort about what the remedy would look like. And it would look like sort of everyday lives for people with disabilities uh, being included back into the community and not being on the edges of things. The analysis was so convincing, and that's the brilliance, I believe, of Wolfensberger, is that he's so, so um, eloquent, he's such a genius at helping us see the world in a different light. So if you're really willing to go there, you can't go back. You have to change what you're doing. What did I think of it? It threw me. Um, it validated everything I had ever thought I believed in and had been told I was crazy about. 
and it was being touted to me by a professor that I frankly thought was crazy. <laughs> and it was like the light shone on my reality because Wolf gave words to the things that my husband and I instinctively knew and understood. He labeled it, he described it, and he explained why what we felt was true. And we felt so enormously validated and charged that I would say um, it was like the rocket launch for my career. I mean, uh, understanding and believing what was possible, what was right, uh, and what made sense. For me, normalization was a very important way of thinking critically, philosophically, about the types of attitudes that uh, uh, are heavily utilized, that are quite uh, discriminatory, the types of uh, discrimination in, in, in funding of uh, institutional type settings versus community and family supports. Uh, it was a systematic uh, uh, approach to thinking about how society devalues and minimizes uh, the significance of uh, a group of people and, and makes them the other uh, entity. The system needs to be about these people who are vulnerable and the medical care needs to be better and the physical setting needs to be better but always with an end towards connecting people back with the families that they came from and giving them lives that are as normal as possible. His effect was on parents in the first place for whom suddenly there were higher expectations, there were things that they could do. They realised the faults in many of the services they'd set up, that they, these were leading to nothing and that they could be built upon and changed and developed. Uh, the services, many people in them, some resisted it, some didn't, some embraced it and that has led to an enormous changes throughout Australia. So much so that um, many people are simply unaware that they're, they're so now so accepted as being such good sense that they're part of the, um, part of what's you expect to get in services for people with disabilities. Gradually, I think, you know, people began to catch the idea that what we were trying, or what Wolf was trying to, and other people were trying to help us think about, was the idea of trying to do things with people and for people in ways that were normative, that remind, that, that, that matched the way that everything else happened for everybody else, which doesn't seem so revolutionary now and makes a lot of sense. It took the blinders off and made me aware of what's out there and the reality of what's out there. And the blinders that most people go through life with without realizing what they're seeing, without understanding that they can do something about it. They may not be able to change it totally, but they can certainly stand by other people. His definition of normalization, that is, that people having access to culturally normative activities, routines, and rhythms and situations uh, promoted culturally normative behavior, and that very often that when people weren't culturally normative or didn't, wasn't, they weren't like everybody else, it had a lot to do with their, their um, environment. In French, we wouldn't say normalization, we would say valorization, we'd say social valorization, because normalization in French means statistically in a normal uh, type of pattern. Although we could understand to, be, to treat somebody normally, okay, people could understand what that meant, but normalization just didn't, um, uh, it just, there's no, other signific uh, there's no other meaning for that word in the dictionary than what it is, and that's statistically the same or whatever. So what we would do is we would say, this concept comes from the northern countries, from, uh, from uh, Sweden, uh, from, uh, from Norway, and we would talk about uh, treating people normally, having a normal rhythm of life, for weekends, years, and people, ooh, that's interesting. Then we would add on what Wolf talked about, the power of imagery, for instance, social integration. Those were the two major areas, I think, that added on. It just made good sense, and it, when you'd worked in the institutions and you knew what life was like there, it wasn't all that hard to draw on 
trying to get people out of the institution so they could live a life that was much more like other people's lives. Mm. Also created uh, a lot of resistance in particularly older parents uh, who felt the things they'd built up were uh, threatened and maybe hadn't been such a good idea. Uh, some were in a rut and didn't want to, and there were many service workers like that too. And it also involved services doing, often providing a much better service and requiring more work. And uh, that wasn't always well received either. You couldn't go anywhere in central New York or in New York State without somebody talking about Wolf, the principles of, of normalization and the application of those principles during that era. Wolf's book, Normalization, is not accessible to everyone. It's pretty intellectual and not everyone can necessarily translate their lessons or the principles into real life. But if you can do that for other people, if you could you could translate it into concrete experiences in the moment, it's enormously powerful and just self-evident. Pretty much most of my career, until recent years, you see a copy of Normalization on people's bookshelves. Normalization was particularly um, attractive to me. This idea, uh, not of making people normal, but of doing, um, taking steps with people that, you know, were culturally normative, so not warehousing them. That's not culturally normative. Community living, uh, rights um, that we take for granted, uh, that's culturally normative. But he also had the very important addendum, which is often forgotten, uh, as much as possible. So as much as current technology and knowledge allows. So Wolf was not uh, kind of a, uh, what he later uh, identified as normalization zealots who kind of deny the reality of impairment or disability and who kind of almost pretend, this is a caricature, but that the whole idea of disability is some sort of nefarious social construction that we have to expose and that once we do that then people will have, in quotes, completely Normal, culturally normative lives. Wolf was acutely aware of the limits imposed by disability and by impairment. Wolf's ideas put actually um, meat on the bones. He talked specifically about how people should be integrated into the community, become part of community, and that the attitudes of um, people who provided services for disabled people had to change, and that it wasn't about being uh, a care provider. It was about walking with that person and being a part of their life and letting them grow and experience uh, community. A number of us grabbed a hold of that and uh, we were very excited about having sort of, in a sense, a blueprint to move forward. Because normalization, in a sense, provided the rationale for what a service might look like other than the ones we already had. The normalization period, of course, was very much within the institutional period. The mistake that was made, of course, that we discovered later is that the idea was that the institution was the evil and that if you were to basically deconstruct the institution brick by brick, then you would have removed the evil. But, of course, as people moved into better settings, we found that, uh, you know, some of the results were disappointing, that some of the service practices of the past followed people and the culture of the past followed people into, you know, sure, the grouping was a bit smaller and, and uh, you know, there was potential for greater individualization, but not always borne out. State by state, states began writing normalization into the mandatory training requirements in, in institutions and group homes, codifying it into state law. Um, and it certainly, it's good kind of in the public relations sense, you know, uh, say anything about me as long as you spell my name correctly. But I also think that that meant that it got oversimplified, that it's impossible to do in state law what Wolf could do in a six-day workshop, 18 hours a day, with three overhead projectors and two slide projectors and a bunch of, of willing disciples. Normalization and the, the principles and the, the, work, the, 
scholarly work that um, was based on the principle of normalization um, certainly changed our lives and Rob's life and certainly made Canada a better place because until the frame, that framework was developed, there first wasn't an understanding about what people's experiences were in the wounding. And there wasn't any hope that things could be different. His theory incorporated all devalued groups, not only all disabled people, but also um, older people, um, ethnic minority people. This is the one that I find the most interesting. They say, well, you know, I, I don't believe in all that normalization stuff because it's only trying to change people. It's not trying to change society. And, of course, if you look at normalization, it's exactly the opposite, okay? I mean, it, it, it has had a, a profound effect on individuals, for sure, but it has, has, has had a profound effect on social systems, on, 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 on government policy, on the structure of services, on the closure of institutions. I mean, you know, it's the mo been, been about the most powerful social change strategy that I've ever seen in my entire life, okay? The idea of normalization has somehow gotten to be this special kind of thing. And it was never meant to be special. It was like we, it's the opposite of special. It, it's to say, if we just treated everybody equally, we wouldn't have had to have the ADA. We wouldn't have had to have civil rights cases. We wouldn't have had to have so much of what we've fought about for years. My fear is 10 years from now, the principle of normalization in human services will be something those of us in the retirement world will talk about the good old days unless it's brought back in some kind of a contextual reference about this was a building block. It wasn't the panacea, wasn't the magic bullet. Uh, and frankly, Wolf, if he would look at public policy, which I know he doesn't tend to do, might be really excited to read what first went in in 1992 in law, which says disability is a natural part of the human experience. It in no way diminishes the right of the individual to, and there's like seven bullets, including fully participate in community life, uh, have a career, have meaningful, all that stuff. I might be able to easily say those legal constructs, that frame of reference, that definition, is really an extrapolation from the principle of normalization. I don't know that that was in the head of Bobby Silverstein working for Senator Harkin at the time. It may not have been. But that might be, and I'm just thinking out loud with you, one of the most phenomenal impacts of it just sort of transformed its way into the culture of how we think about people with disabilities. I still think it's one of the most powerful, simple constructs you can explain it to almost anybody. Now, Wolf tended to make it somewhat more complicated when he developed his training sessions and uh, uh, tried to systematize it. But for me, it was always that, that very simple template that you could put on to almost any situation that really helped you think about were we living up to um, a normal life for somebody with a disability. If I could describe a new normalization, it would be a normalization that has a social consciousness, a normalization that recognizes that we're all in this together and we can't just over-engineer for the individual or keep focusing on what the individual's rights are, but we need to think about how can we all make a contribution, no matter who we are, and um, find a simple path to make sure that you may not have a, a life that's normalized to this expectation, but you're still normalized to, to an ordinary community expectation of what a life is.